My name is Ofra Klein. I'm a, a researcher at the European University Institute in Florence. And uh, together with Barat, Barat Ganesh from uh, the University of Groningen, we are uh, today giving a workshop on uh, discourse analysis. Uh, well, it fits well with uh, the, the session or the entire overview uh, of the session today, which is about how to uh, analyze and measure the, uh, the impact you're having online. And we are trying to explain to you how you can do this by uh, carrying out a discourse analysis. Uh, so um, what we will be discussing today is, uh, so the agenda of today is first, uh, we'll give you a brief introduction to what discourse analysis is, what it is compared to, for example, content analysis, which is perhaps better known to many of you, and how you can actually use this. So we give some examples on that. And then we'll have a small assignment that everyone can participate in, which will actually give you a, a glimpse of how you can actually carry out your own discourse analysis. Uh, afterwards, Barat will take over and he will uh, discuss how you can actually use discourse and uh, content analysis for counter messaging campaigns. This will also include another assignment in which you will look at uh, a YouTube video and how you can actually analyze the frames and the discourse of this video, as well as the responses to this video. And as a wrap up, you're free to ask any questions that you're having, but I guess you're also allowed to ask any questions that you're having during the entire session. So uh, feel free to interrupt whenever uh, you have any uh, uncertainties. Um, so first of all, a brief introduction to what this course analysis is. This course in itself is actually referring to all types of communication. So both verbal communication, textual communication, non-verbal communication, such as memes or images or GIFs. And this course in particular looks at the context in which this communication takes place. So the idea is that this course is not only shaped by the context, the social context in which it occurs, but at the same time, it also shapes this context. So it shapes uh, the power relations that exist between people and how people actually look at each other and perceive their own position in society. This course analysis in specific is when a researcher tries to look at language, for example, texts or other forms of communication to understand how society is constructed in this form of communication. Um, it is actually a systematic study of this communication to find how actually there is meaning given to the social life and social reality. And it does so by looking at what is communicated and how this is communicated. And generally, this course analysis actually evolved from linguistics, so it was mainly focused on textual content. But uh, more and more, this is actually also focused on uh, visual content. And this is especially the case with the rise of social media, where, of course, memes and GIFs and uh, emojis are more and more prominent in our ways of communicating with one another. Um, so discourse and content analysis are often um, taken together and confused with one another. And that makes sense because they're very similar to one another and they can actually overlap. But there's a strong difference in how what, what is perceived to be a discourse analysis and a content analysis. And this has to do with how actually the world is perceived by these from these different strands. So for example, for discourse analysis, the idea is that reality is socially constructed. So you, you construct the reality through the language that you're using. And the language that you're using actually constructs social reality. Whereas in content analysis, the idea is that social reality is the way it is. This is perhaps a bit vague, but we'll give some examples that will make it a bit more clear. And as a consequence of this different perception of reality, the methods are very different. So because there is an independent reality according to content analysis, there's a clear and systematic way in which you can analyze this reality. So you can, for example, say, I want to see how many texts are about Muslims and you just count the word Muslim. There's a clear and systematic way of doing this. Uh, and it's often therefore also quantified 
Whereas for discourse analysis, it's different. So the, the analytical categories that you're using, you kind of get them from reading the text and seeing what is important uh, from this text. It's therefore a bit more qualitative in nature. And as a consequence, there's also a different focus. So for content analysis, the focus is often on the idea that the text is stable. So you can count the words Muslim, but you do not perceive this word to change over time, the meaning of the word to change over time. Whereas for discourse analysis, you can actually expect that even though Muslims are still referred to as Muslims, the way they are discussed differs over time. So there's a slight difference. Um, and both methods actually have their, their benefits and their downsides. So a benefit of uh, discourse analysis is that it actually uh, that you don't have a predefined idea of what you're analyzing. And this makes it easier to actually uncover what are the important aspects. So if you're analyzing, for example, the content of a campaign, uh, you can maybe find new things that you would have not expected before that are actually important and seem to be helpful for your campaign. Um, at the same time, because it is a bit less systematic than content analysis, it's sometimes difficult to track the trends. It is a bit more time consuming. And it, of course, requires a better understanding of the context. So you need to put in a bit more effort. Um, another benefit of the discourse analysis is that it takes into account that there's, of course, perhaps a change possible in language and the context. And it provides a certain richness and depth that content analysis cannot actually provide. Um, now I'll go on with um, giving uh, some examples of what actually uh, discourse analysis is and what content analysis is. And you can perhaps better understand the differences. And I will also show how you can actually do a content analysis using a bit of a discourse analysis approach. Um, so one. Uh, well, rather well-known example, especially in the fields where Barath and I work in, which is on the far right on the internet, is uh, the use of hateful symbols online. So social media platforms tend to nowadays censor far right actors more and more, especially if they clear, give clear overt forms of hate speech. And as a consequence, uh, these actors sometimes try to use symbols uh, in order to like signal their belonging to the far right or give over a certain message to other people that understand this message. Uh, but uh, what the meaning of the message is depends on the context in which it is shared. And a very well-known example is Pepper the Frog, which you now see uh, here on this slide, which was used a lot during the 2016 US presidential elections. And initially, it wasn't a hateful frog. It was just a cartoon character. But it was adopted by uh, well, white supremacist users as a way to signal their belonging to the white supremacist movement. Um, so for, for people who were not aware of the meaning of the symbol, it was just a normal frog. But the idea of the discourse analysis is to take into account who shares this image and in what type of context is it shared and what is then the meaning of it. And because Peppa the Frog was often also portrayed with Nazi symbols, you can actually see that it is, especially when it's shared by certain people, it can be perceived as a hateful symbol. And uh, the same goes actually with the, the milk emoji, which was uh, oftentimes back then in the 2016 elections used by these far right, um, or especially white supremacist Facebook, uh, Twitter users to, uh, prove their identity to the white supremacist movement. So many users would put the milk emoji in their uh, Twitter biography, and then it would signal their belonging to the, to the white supremacist movement. And the idea behind this was that if you are a real man, not uh, some kind of vegan leftist person, you drink actual proper milk and not uh, these vegan types of replacement milks. Um, and similarly, another example of this is the use of the, the hand sign, the emoji, which you see here as well, um, which was actually also emerged as a joke on 4chan, one of the messaging boards, but actually was used uh, eventually to signal that you belong to the white supremacist movement and that you were okay 
And at the same time, this uh, symbol was also quite often used by Donald Trump himself. So if you can see on the next slide, um, he uses it quite often uh, in his speech. Uh, and this is why also many of these users on, uh, on Twitter, for example, would uh, use this hand emoji in their uh, biography to signal that they were OK and belonging to this uh, specific type of movements. So this course analysis in this sense uh, shows that you can, of course, see the content, which is a frog or a milk glass or a hand emoji. But with this course analysis, you take into account the context in which it is shared and what then the uh, perceived meaning of this is. Uh, in contrast with this, you have uh, the content analysis, which I actually explained already before, where you just look at for example, how often do you see a frog? Or in this uh, example, there is an overview of how often the words uh, migration, Islam, gender, and uh, the EU were shared on the page of the UK Independence Party. So it's just generally looking at the word usage and not necessarily how the words are used. Um, and in this sense, you, for example, don't see that there's a huge uh, change in how often, for example, uh, migration or Islam or gender is uh, used. Uh, but when you look closer and maybe add uh, more discourse analytical uh, approach to this as well, then you can see that actually there is a shift visible because the same words are used in a very different way. You could, for example, used to have a LGBTQ uh, section. Uh, in the beginning and uh, back then when they talked about transgenders uh, well transgenders was not so much a topic but when they talked about gays uh, it was mainly about the members that belonged to UKIP whereas over time the discourse on for example transgender and gender itself and women was becoming much more harsher and critical because it was considered uh, a leftist ideology um, and this is another example of um, how women, how the discourse on women changed. So first, when you talk about women, you talk about the female members of UKIP, and later on, it talks about the de declaration of sex as optional and how this is madness. So this shows actually that both discourse and content analysis are useful approaches, but it's also useful to actually combine them together. Um, and an example of this is actually, uh, uh, I will show that now is a paper that I did on uh, analyzing memes on social media, memes of the British National Party, a far right party in the UK, uh, which is very marginal and basically non existent now, but they were online, they were very popular. And the idea of using a content analysis with a discursive approach is that you're actually keeping the systematic aspect of the content analysis, but you're accounting for the context and shifts that a discourse analysis actually allows you to do. So the way you do this is that you go back and forth between the data and the code book you're using to coding the means. And you do this uh, in order to find new categories that you would not have expected before. And then again, you start counting how many of these categories exist. And if you find a new category, you add it again. So I looked at how information was represented in images of uh, this party. And I came up with uh, four categories. The last one is fuzzy. It's like the, that's the two ones that I could not represent in any of the others. Um, and you see, for example, that information can be shared rather factually, for example, by stating what is the position of the party on issues such as here energy, or an image showing uh, someone of the party giving a speech. This is a rather factual way of portraying the party, for example. In addition to this, there's also images that, for example, um, are funny in nature. So they don't really represent reality. Uh, they make a joke. But the assumption is that the user will know that this is a joke and will not misunderstand it as something being false or uh, uh, wrong. So this is a joke about uh, Jeremy Corbyn and uh, um, yeah, how I, it's also funny because he wears like a tracksuit and doesn't look very um, formal as he usually does. Um, 
and at the same time you uh, have images that are not supposed to be oh could you perhaps click through because i wasn't sure that it was a click through slide um so the idea with the funny images is that you actually um the poster of the of the image perceives the user to be smart enough to understand that it's a joke so uh, it's not likely that the person will uh, think oh uh, jeremy corbyn is really crazy but he will perceive it as a joke then there's other images that are actually meant to mislead the user in some kind of way an example of this is for example the image that you see here of a, a, a veiled woman walking on the streets and she's walking past a victim of uh, a terrorist attack and in london and there was no information given and this is a suggestive kind of image that suggests that the woman as the only one in the picture does not care about the image and by chance she's also veiled but when you zoom into the picture you see that she's very distressed and she's on the phone and uh, there is uh, there's nothing that suggests that she actually does not care at all so this would be an image that is meant to mislead people to think that it's a muslim terrorist attack as they will claim it and she is a muslim and doesn't care Another way to mislead users is to frame a certain issue in a certain partisan way, like the, the middle image, which says it's not a housing crisis, it's a migration crisis. We don't have a shortage of houses, we just have too many immigrants. And another way would be to sensationalize or exaggerate certain things. An example is the last image, which talks about um, a sex scandal in the UK which is often linked to Muslims by the far right. And then it says our children are not halal meat. Um, and there's many of these images that show crying kids. So they're very um, sensationalized in that sense. So this is a very different way of portraying images than the funny or factual ways. And then the last category is um, images that are completely fabricated. So uh, this is an example of that, where you see Theresa May who wears the headscarf and the idea that the, the UK is already, as it says, uh, there's now two laws in the land, uh, which is obviously fabricated. But uh, And the meaning of the, the potential aim of the person who shares the image is also to mislead the viewer to think it is real, because the Photoshop is also quite uh, well done. Um, so in this sense, um, we can actually try to uh, quantify different ways of sharing information. And um, at the same time, you could also look at how these different types of information sharing have a different impact, uh, which is something that is actually the main focus of today's um, general session. Uh, but we will give just an example of how to do that. And a way to do that on Facebook is to look at how people respond to different types of content by looking at these uh, reactions. And uh, when you do this for uh, the different types of information that is shared in, in memes, you can see that uh, if a meme is funny or if it's factual or is, if it's misleading, there's a very different type of response. So you see that, of course, as you might expect, Funny images lead to significantly higher uh, haha responses compared to the more factual and the more misleading images. Uh, whereas the more misleading images actually lead to a lot of anger, to sadness, and a lot more comments compared to the other types of images. Um, and this is very interesting to see, especially if you're trying to make a, do a campaign online because you can see how different discursive approaches can actually evoke completely different responses to users. Um, yes, as I said, funny images lead to the happiest responses, factual images lead to more enthusiasm, and um, yeah, misleading images lead to more anger and surprise, etc. So um, I made a small assignment that you could use in order to, um, it's the next slide actually, <laughs> thank you, um, that you could use to uh, perhaps figure out how to carry out a discourse analysis of your own using also visual content of the same page that I used in this example. Uh, perhaps I should share 
the link in the chat if that's possible. I shared the link where you can find uh, the images for which you can do this assignment in the chat. Um, so there's eight images, and these are the, actually the most um, liked images, so the most popular images on the entire uh, British National Party Facebook page, and they are ranked uh, from number one, the most um, popular one to number eight, the still very popular but less popular one. And the idea is to perhaps take a look at these images and think about categories that you could use, like aspects of an image that you could, co could code. Um, and um, yeah, you can think of basically anything. And what it, it doesn't necessarily need to be anything you can quantify uh, or count. Uh, but it is, yeah, <laughs> you can. You can and you don't have to. And another uh, question is, um, whether there are certain aspects of the image that you think can explain why these are very popular and why some of the images are more popular than the others. Um, I think we have like maybe five minutes to take a look at the image, five or ten minutes, and then um, we can perhaps discuss them in person. Yeah, just to jump in there, uh, Claudia, that was a, that's an interesting point, right? Um, Depending on what you're looking for, you could try to identify, for example, hate uh, hate expressions or, or specific kinds of illegal content. So that's one thing you could try to do. Um, but it's also useful to try to look a little bit broadly, right? To think about what are the kinds of ways in which that particular image is trying to connect to a particular kind of political context, like um, the political views of a particular group of people. And that might also help us to think about, okay, but then how do we construct a message to to try to challenge that. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit more um, after after this assignment. Okay, um, I think it's now time to just hear about some of your different responses and uh, the way you tackled the the different questions in this uh, in this assignment. But Afra, maybe do you want to just give a few words before we start? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to tell all my uh, ideas of how you could analyze this before uh, any of you actually get to work. But I think the, the responses that Claudia gave are very good. So for example, immigration, sexual abuse, you could code those as, as topics. So then you would choose which topic is actually addressed. The color use is a very good one. That is one that is perhaps um, one that reflects um, perhaps the differences in how uh, different topics are discussed. So if you see, for example, image four, which is about the, the head teacher and a, a two, about a two English and two white school, as well as the uh, last image, which is about Putin. These are about the heroes. So they say big thumbs up for Putin and for uh, the school teachers. And they use the same kind of color compared to, for example, the other images. So colors is definitely very good, just as indeed metaphors, uh, and the earlier remark by uh, Katarina, was it Katarina? Oh no, it's also Claudia actually, <laughs> about uh, illegal expressions. You could, for example, indeed look at hate, whether there is hate speech in the, in the image or not, and how, how bad the hate is. Is it just, just an insult or is it actually infringing on rights, for example, as in the images that say, uh, we close the borders and we freeze the flights, or we ban the burqa. Um, but perhaps before we continue, there are some other people in the session who would like to give their uh, ideas of what they considered as important aspects of the images. Yes, the thumbs up indeed. So that's actually uh, the aspect that I, I didn't really select images that were very unpopular. Uh, but almost all the images that are indeed, because these are from a file of like a, thousand, a couple of thousand images, these are the most uh, popular ones. And all of them except one, uh, the one which has a uh, public, bring back the public hangings of pedophiles and rapists, all of them have the share and like. So indeed, that's the way to indeed increase perhaps also the likes. Um, 
you could, for example, also look at uh, how who is portrayed and how these people are portrayed. So, for example, in image one, which is definitely a pop, uh, 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 what is it? Um, uh, good emotional image. So it doesn't it doesn't reflect any bad emotions. It's about the veteran who was found in Normandy. Um, here you see indeed a, a guy, a, a man who looks very friendly and who is smiling. And the same goes with the, the school of children in image four. Uh, at the same time, you see, for example, Cameron, he's clearly disliked and he's portrayed um, pretty stupid. So in, in like uh, image three, he doesn't look very good. It's not, <laughs> the image is not taken from a very nice angle. Ah, yeah, I think this is actually a very good uh, remark, Kian. Kian, I'm not sure if I pronounced it right. The eyes the, depicting that uh, behind the field is a girl who was forced to hit her beautiful. Um, let's see. Yes, indeed. So the logo is uh, the logo of the British National Party, which is indeed used in this image. It's often um, it's actually the logo of the party itself, uh, so the heart with the British flag. And it's indeed often used on specific type of images. So you could indeed see it here as a, as a reflection of the us group, the British who had the right values, and indeed as a call for action. Um, and then uh, when I talk back about like the representation of people, you see, for example, Putin is, is being represented as pretty as, as very handsome, good looking, and as someone who is quite tough. Whereas if you compare it with, um, with for example, Obama and Cameron, they look like they have no clue what they are doing. They look very really, um, clueless and they're, they just don't know how to handle the situation. So you need a strong leader who does. And also when you compare, for example, the, the children, the smiling children and the, the smiling old men with, for example, the the migrants or in image seven who look very angry and uh, aggressive. There's a different way of portraying uh, uh, people in order to signal an important message. But there's a, a lot of other uh, ways in which you could, uh, for example, also look at these images. Another way would be to see uh, what type of words are used, um, so, such as the words white or sickening, um, or in the case of uh, dying for diversity, this diversity idea that is often refer referred to in many of these far right uh, images. And you also see that these images not only use specific words, but they also emphasize them by using the caps. So a big thumbs up, but also sickening. If you see the same image, it's sickening that this school had to refuse an award because it was too white. So just not the only the visual aspects, but especially in memes, the use, the combination of language and visual is very important. Um, I, uh, I have a question actually. Um, what did uh, what did people think for for why it is that uh, the image of the D-Day veteran was the most uh, popular? Actually, I filtered it out because it was twice the most popular. So sometimes they keep sharing the same image, and the first two popular ones were both the same ones. So it's it's very. Uh, it's very popular. What do you think, Baras? <clears throat> well, I, I wanted to bring it up because, um, yeah, it's meant to show respect for veterans, right? But we're also talking about the uh, fascist nationalist party, right? Um, so here's one of the ways in which kind of social context can be really useful. Because one of the things we can make sense of is that obviously if this is a party that imagines itself to be patriotic, um, then these kinds of things are going to be really popular with its followers, right? 
So you might also want to think about what are the different functions that these different kinds of messages have, right? So you have the two most popular ones, which is one is calling for a kind of uh, curtailment of people's uh, uh, personal rights about what, what they can or cannot wear. Whereas in the other one, it's about celebrating a, a particular person that has this kind of connection to, to uh, like, a, a, as, as a patriot, right? Um, so in a way, what, what I've seen in similar kinds of um, contexts, but maybe more in terms of associated with disinformation, is that images like that, I, I, and offer, I, don't, I don't know if this is how it worked out in your research, but images like that with that veteran, um, are used often to build the following and increase the amount of people who have an interest in the page. And then you have the more extreme kind of uh, political ideas being slipped in as well, right? With uh, banning the burqa or curtailing uh, immigration in order to prevent Ebola and this kind of thing. Um, so, so one of the ways you might want to think about is what kinds of positive narratives do they use? How does that connect to the context of the, uh, of the group you're looking at? And then how are particular kinds of calls of action also being designed and, and being used. Yes, exactly. That makes sense, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and I think that also the comment of uh, Kian fits with this. So mm, it's quite a radical message to say we ban the burqa, but indeed then you have these very sweet, the uh, heart uh, and the British uh, kind of like flag, which perhaps, um, reflects a lot of the people's values who are not perhaps so extreme in their views. So it might indeed be also a way to uh, like bring to them, we're, we're not as extreme, we also have a, a good mission with this. So I see, it's a good point. Um, anything else, perhaps? And otherwise we should perhaps move on to the rest of the... Yeah, I, th I think it's time we, we move on. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about discourse analysis and counter analysis, uh, sorry, content analysis for counter messaging. Um, and one of the things you're gonna notice when you're trying to use these methods is you're, you're really trying to get a sense of what are the different ways, for example, if you're looking at a far right group, what are the different ways you might inject a kind of narrative into a group or into a particular uh, kind of system um, and, and conversation in order to try to challenge some of those ideas, right? That's the kind of idea about what counter messaging is. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how do we actually do the kind of research we need to, to make sense of and, and uh, do effective counter messaging. So I think we'll start by just talking a little bit about what counter messaging is, right? So counter messaging is one of those tools among many others to address extremist content online. Um, and so as I've said, right, uh, you'll find that most of those who talk about counter messaging or counter narrative say you've got to spend some time doing research about your audience. You've got to spend some time researching what kind of the, the key messages and the narratives are that they use and then doing some research to find out how to poke holes in and challenge uh, those kinds of narratives. So one of the key aspects then of doing counter messaging is actually doing a certain level of uh, discourse analysis and what I want to say is also that combining that discourse analysis with content analysis can actually be really powerful. So you're going to spend a lot of time before you're developing any kind of counter messaging strategy doing some of this kind of research. Um, and what I want to suggest is that there's ways you can kind of bring discourse analysis and content analysis together to construct more effective uh, counter messaging content. So I'm going to talk through in a couple of examples um, uh, how, to, how to do that. So when I was, um, I'm going to just kind of quickly compare two projects that I've completed in the last couple of years um, and how you can kind of connect the content you're going to look at with a particular kind of, uh, of a research question. So a recent discourse analysis project I did was asking this question, how is rage, like the, the motion of anger and, uh, and rage, how is that used to connect the alt-right with the populist radical right in the US and the UK. And by populist radical right, I'm, I'm interested in kind of the parties like the, um, uh, like the Brexit party now in, in the UK or the UKIP party uh, as well, more specifically with, uh, with the uh, kind of the turn towards the radical right in the, in the Republican party in the United States. 
So my method was to use discourse analysis to see how audiences describe themselves. So I looked at what are the different ways that Twitter users kind of talk about themselves and describe themselves in their, in their uh, user profiles. I looked at the content of the most popular retweets and I paid a lot of attention to social context. Um, and then I, I spent a lot of time trying to look at uh, the most kind of popular or common images. And so there it was really about kind of connecting that with social context and trying to see what kinds of emotions did those different kinds of pieces of content that I was looking at, uh, what kind of emotions did those inspire? So that was kind of how I started categorizing the, the content that I had. So my answer to this question is that uh, rage is, connects the alt-right and the populist radical right by constructing the false idea that white people are the most marginalized in American and British society. So in a way, they're trying to, what I found was that they were trying to hijack the idea that kind of comes from uh, people who are working on issues around racial justice or gender justice, um, the idea that there's groups of people that are marginalized, that like, for example, black people in the US are more marginalized uh, be, it, when it comes to policing, for example, in, in terms of police brutality. So what I found was that what the alt-right was really trying to do uh, was trying to make the assertion that actually it's white people now that are the most marginalized in American and British society. And uh, that's one of the kinds of uh, ideas you can gain from doing discourse analysis. I'm really sorry there's some construction going on in my building here, and I, uh, I, did, I thought they would be done, but uh, unfortunately that's not the case. So I, I hope I, I can still come through clearly. Now another approach is content analysis, and here I was asking a different kind of question, which is what themes have to be in a tweet in order to lead to transnational interaction between far-right Twitter users in Germany, France, Italy, and the UK? So here I used content analysis and social network analysis to categorize the content in the tweets, and then I use statistical analysis to figure out which content is most likely to be transnational. So what we did was we made a social network graph of all of the different tweets, and then we looked at which users those tweets were, uh, were retweeting. And what we found was that people who, uh, so, so we were able to kind of categorize those retweets based on whether or not they were transnational. And so what we were able to do is then use statistical analysis to show that based on the different categories we had. So we had a few different categories. One of them was uh, nativist or racist kind of content. Um, and we found that tweets that contain that kind of uh, nativist or racist or particularly Islamophobic narratives are the most likely to be retweeted by someone in another country. Now I bring up these examples, not because we expect that you're gonna be able to go home and do this. This takes a, a, a lot of work and a lot of uh, uh, a fair bit of programming to do all of this but just to get a sense of how these two different methods can be used to uh, answer different kinds of questions um, and how you might be able to start trying to think about, okay, well, how do I, how do I use these kinds of methods in order to direct my kind of development um, of, uh, 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 um, of, of some kind of project around counter messaging? So you might wanna figure out what are the tweets that, uh, like what are the most kind of common themes that get the most likes, for example, that's a bit easier to do. Um, and then what you might want to do is try to figure out, okay, well, how do I, how do I try to counter the messages that come up uh, and get liked the most by the audiences that I'm interested in? So to do that, it can be really useful to combine these discourse analysis and content analysis methods. So with discourse analysis, like we've said, we're really focusing on how narratives speak to a social context. So one thing that we'll see is that um, extremists will often present one aspect of truth to try to encourage a particular kind of interpretation of their narrative. And in, the, in academic language, we often refer to that as framing. Um, and so frames can be a really good way of trying to connect what people are saying with a broader social context. And in the next slide, I'll, I'll explain how that works a little bit more. And then what we can do, once we've started to use discourse analysis and look at lots of texts, we can start to chop it up and say, okay, well, there's different categories that we're starting to see. And then what you can do is use different kinds of data, right? Uh, the number of upvotes on YouTube or Reddit, the number of likes, the number of shares. And uh, as Ofra showed, right, you can look at um, the number of kind of happy face emojis versus angry emojis. Uh, to identify what is the relative salience of specific frames, right? And by salience, I mean, what are the specific frames that tend to come up and be repeated the most? And then that can help you focus what you're going to, uh, what, what kinds of counter messages uh, you're going to try to put out. 
So before we get there, I just want to explain what framing is. So the kind of uh, textbook definition of framing uh, is as follows. To frame is to select some aspects of a perceived reality and make them more salient in communicating text in such a way as to promote a problem definition, causal interpretation, moral evaluation, or a treatment recommendation. So I know that that's a lot of kind of complicated academic words, um, but what I really want to get at is the idea is that when you're framing something, you're selecting and shaping your representation of a phenomenon so that people have a particular way of understanding that problem that you can shape what their interpretation of that might be. You can have a particular kind of, um, uh, try to have like a moral implication from the, from the, from, from the content that, um, uh, that, that you're creating and shaping, right? So you could use framing as a way to kind of imply a particular moral uh, belief. Um, or you can try to shape how it is that people will kind of treat and uh, deal with that, that kind of content. So here, I know I'm sure all of you know the, 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 the tragic news for out of France uh, in the last few days, uh, in which uh, a, a, I believe it was a teacher was, uh, was killed um, uh, by, by an individual who had some kind of connections to, uh, or, or had some influence from, uh, by, by radical Islam. Um, and uh, what you can see is how two different newspapers have tried to discuss this. So on the left, you have the Daily Express, which is a, which is a right-wing tabloid uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, the Daily Express has pretty low standards in terms of accuracy and tends to be quite sensationalist. And here it says, France terror, man beheaded near school in Paris before attackers shot dead by police. And then the Guardian, which is a, a left-leaning paper, which is much more professional than the, uh, than the Daily Express, has the headline, Macron speaks of existential fight against terrorism after teacher killed in France. So the point I want you to think about here is that when you're looking at the Daily Express versus looking at the Guardian, they're both trying to frame the same phenomenon in a different way. So by using the term beheaded in all caps, the Daily Express is trying to communicate a particular kind of problem. Uh, the Daily Express is also trying to communicate a sense of urgency and an emotional response from you. Um, and then on the other hand, for The Guardian, it's trying to keep it quite reasonable. Um, you can tell that they're trying to be a little bit more factual and trying to, uh, to toe a line here about calling it terrorism um, rather than using the term beheaded. Uh, uh, and as well, The Guardian is also trying to emphasize that this is also a policy issue that uh, Emmanuel Macron is trying to deal with, whereas for The Daily Express, it's really just focusing on the terror attack. So these are the different ways in which framing uh, can be can be really uh, can be really important in terms of thinking about social context. Because if you remember back when we talked about discourse analysis, that um, in the introductory slides, that the way we talk about things can actually shape the world that we live in, that shapes our social reality. Um, one of the things that we can find is that. Um, these kinds of framings actually really shape how we respond and how we think about what's going on in the world. Now, different kinds of framings are things that are used really quite extensively by extremists. And so it's something that we need to, to really kind of uh, be on the lookout for. So in another project I'm gonna talk about really quickly, um, what we did was we, uh, uh, we wanted to get a sense of how is it that far-right politicians and social uh, and members of social movements talk about Europe. And we wanted to know how do they think about, for example, the European Union, but also kind of uh, European integration and all of these kind of broader things about Europe. So what we wanted to do was study the frames that were associated with Europe. Um, and for this, we were writing an article uh, about particular kinds of crisis. So we were looking at different kinds of ways in which uh, discussions about Europe actually kind of related to a particular kind of crisis. And we had different kinds of crisis that we had identified, right? So a crisis of cultural identity, uh, particularly around like the maintenance of Europe's cultural identity, um, crisis around defense and security, especially around terrorism, crisis in terms of the economy, um, and then crisis of representation, right? The idea that the European Union especially is not necessarily completely representative of all of the people in Europe. And then we also had other, which kind of referred to instances in which uh, there wasn't really a reference to any kind of crisis. 
And so what we did was we looked at, uh, we collected, um, uh, I can't remember now, but it was probably a few hundred thousand tweets from, um, from politicians in four different countries, uh, as well as from leaders and social movements associated with the far right. And then we categorize each of those collocations. Uh, so, so what we did was we took all of those tweets and then we looked at every tweet with the word Europe in it. And then we looked at every time there was uh, another word that came next to the word Europe, right? That explained, uh, uh, that gave a sense of the frame associated with, uh, associated with Europe. So then we categorize each collocation according to those specific frames that, that I just talked about, those four frames that I just talked about. And then what we did was we counted the occurrence of each frame amongst those uh, far-right politicians and social movements and compared it to their audience. So that's what you see here on the side where it says audience and seed. Uh, seed refers then to the, to the politicians uh, and social movements. And from, from there, we could kind of identify what the most common frames were, what audiences engaged with the most, and then we could prioritize certain themes in a potential intervention. Now, in this paper, we weren't interested in creating an intervention. We were mostly uh, just trying to understand how do they talk about Europe. Um, but what we can see is that across the audience and the seed, across most countries, um, this kind of theme about cultural identity and the loss of Europe's cultural identity was what really motivated both the audience as well as the politicians and social movements. Um, so actually what we started to see was that uh, there was one theme that was really central. So if we were to design an intervention, that would be the theme that we would want to uh, really want to focus on. So what I'm gonna do now is kind of introduce uh, our last assignment and for which we're gonna take another 10 minutes and then we'll have some time to, to discuss as a group. Um, and so what I want you to do is try to think about how do I analyze a narrative using discourse analysis? How do I use content analysis to figure out what it is that resonates the most? And then how do I construct counter messages? So I've dropped in some hints in this kind of graphic on the right here, which looks at, you know, what are the key frames being rep uh, presented? How do those key frames relate to a broader context? So those are some of the questions you want to ask when you're doing discourse analysis. You might also want to think about whether or not those keyframes also resonate with an audience. Then what you want to do is start moving into content analysis. So you want to think about what frames the audiences seem to pick up on the most. So you might have identified three or four different frames, and then you might want to count what are the frames that seem to appear the most from the audience, or what is it that they seem to like or engage with or share with the most. Then you might want to look at how often do the different uh, frames you've identified appear in audience responses. So most social media platforms offer comments, right? So you might want to start looking for different kinds of frames and comments. And that's what we're going to practice in this assignment. Then when you're moving into constructing a counter message, you want to focus on the frames that resonate the most. And then you want to find information that kind of debunks these frames or promotes a kind of alternative interpretation. So what you're doing here is, finding the frames that seem to resonate the most with your audience, and then trying to construct another frame that challenges it. So that's a bit what you're trying to do when it comes to counter messages or, or counter, counter narratives. So you might want to take a quick screenshot of this slide uh, or come back to it um, uh, as you're doing the assignment. Uh, but what we're going to do now is I'm going to have you watch a far-right video. Uh, it took me a long time to find one that was only five minutes because they, they really talk a lot. Um, but this is one that's kind of a little bit topical because it's about the uh, protests in the context of the coronavirus situation um, from Paul Joseph Watson, who's a far-right YouTuber, uh, closely associated with Infowars and other kinds of conspiracy theories. And I want you to uh, kind of... Uh, address this, uh, this assignment in two parts. So first, I'd like you to watch the video. It should take you about five minutes and identify one or two key frames that are presented, right? And then I want you to think about what research would you do to challenge one of these frames? Then, while, after you're done looking at the video, just have a quick scroll through 10 or 15 comments under the video on YouTube. Um, and then just try to start answering. You won't have time to do this properly, but just try to start answering what frames from the video seem to resonate the most with the commenters um, and what tends to get the most upvotes. And then I want you to think about how would you start categorizing those responses. So I'm just going to send you a link to the video now.
I put it in the chat, I think. So. I, I think, oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. No, no worries. Um, so let's take then uh, five minutes for you to watch the video and then maybe seven minutes for you to, uh, to, to kind of think about uh, looking at the comments and coming up with some of those key frames. Um, so maybe at uh, 1.50, we'll come back for a wrap up and a discussion together. Okay, just a little update. I think you should have had enough time by now to watch the video or just wrapping it up. Um, so just take now a few more minutes to uh, think about the frames in that video and to look through uh, some of these, uh, some of the comments below it. Okay, appealing to the family, family emotions, funerals, good. So those are those are more kind of um, uh, kind of specific types of uh, statements, right? It's not necessarily the frame. What we're trying to do is also get a sense of, right, how is he talking about the, the family, right? Like what is the way he's trying to shape the way we understand what a, what, what a family is or how we understand kind of like the, the family, right? Um, <clears throat> so one of the ways we might kind of uh, expand on that a little bit is think about, um, He's kind of framing like the family as someone who's making all of these sacrifices. And then there's all of these protesters out there who are not making those sacrifices, right? Um, so, so that would be one way in which the family kind of appears as a frame. So one of the things here is just to get an idea of what are the kind of subtle differences between like uh, a frame and the way that information is being communicated um, and, and what's being selected as opposed to what he's actually saying, right? So what he's actually saying is parts of that selection process, um, but there's also something specific about how, how he's framing family uh, in this video. Uh, did anyone have uh, notice any other frames? Uh, so Paulina has uh, uh, BLM protesters are being praised even though they violate social distancing measures and anti-COVID protesters being attacked for protesting. But one of the so so one of the things that that you'll notice is that many of the BLM protesters were were very wearing masks, right? And a lot of the anti-COVID uh, protesters um, were not wearing masks, uh, as kind of by definition, because many of those were anti-mask protests, right? Um, so one of the things he's doing is trying to twist the information. He never mentions actually how many of those people at the BLM protests in London or in the U.S. were actually wearing. Uh, personal protective equipment, right? And that's actually really crucial because um, there is research that's found that specifically because the BLM protests in the United States, I don't know about the US, but in the United States, they were very particular about making sure people wore masks and had protective equipment. Um, and the, the research from the National B Bureau of Economics Research uh, actually found that the uh, BLM protests did not increase uh, the spread of the virus at all. Um, so here's a link to that paper. I'll just drop it here. It's not a very exciting paper, um, but it's also about kind of thinking about how is he framing it? What are the facts that he's actually sharing with us? Um, uh, yes, the but, idea uh, that... The video in, uh, uh, in sorry, the, Alfred, did you, did you want to say something? Like the, the, Yes, in the UK, the video that he showed was very much for without wearing masks. So perhaps indeed um, he was focusing a lot on the UK context for this. And then um, both the remark of Paulina and Kian, I, perhaps both of them can be grouped as this double standard. Would you, would you see that as a frame in itself, a double standard frame? Yeah. So, so what you've got with the um, with that point about uh, uh, the biased media, right? Is uh, he's trying to suggest that the media is biased and that only when it comes to uh, to kind of like uh, right wing groups do they, does the media actually seem to care? Whenever the um, whenever it's about BLM, the media doesn't care. Um, Good. Claudia has also picked up on this idea that there's this framing of the B, uh, BLM protesters as the enemies and kind of crazy. And he also does kind of frame it as a sickness, right? Uh, 
So these are some of the frames that you can start to deduce from, from, looking, at the, um, uh, from looking at the video. Now, kind of going into the comments, did anyone notice maybe what's, uh, um, what seemed to resonate a little bit more than others? Uh, so Kian says, uh, uh, UK citizens are angry that their people are taking part in a problem uh, that they don't see in their own country. Um, framing uh, BLM as being outside of the family that he speaks about, that's also important. Um, Afra mentions common sense. Do you want to talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, I saw just a few comments that mentioned that uh, the world is going crazy and uh, this guy, at least he has common sense and uh, all the, what is it, companies are now supporting Black Lives Matter. The world has gone crazy. And so that's maybe the common sense principle. Yeah, that might even also be kind of its own frame, right? Um, uh, also, when he's trying to, when Paul Joseph Watson's trying to point out how people are hypocrites, that also seems to get picked up a little bit in the comments. Um, but one of the things I just want you to get thinking about, and that's why I set this exercise up the way that we did, um, is to, to go from identifying frames in a video that's related to maybe like an influencer or an important character in the extremist groups you might be looking at, and then all of the comments as a way of trying to see, okay, well, I started with some frames here from the video, and then now I'm trying to see what frames kind of repeat themselves when people are uh, 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 discussing with one another. Um, so again, it's just something to think about as kind of like an approach for how you can actually test out, okay, well, what are the frames that I need to address and what are the things that are kind of getting picked up on the most? So I think we can leave it here for discussion on this assignment um, and I'll turn it back over to Afra to wrap up. Okay, I, I don't know exactly how to wrap this up. I mean, if there's any questions from the room, feel free to ask them. I personally have a have a question for you, but I don't know whether you uh, because I think your focus is also not on uh, what is it on counter speech specifically. I wonder what would be a, what would be a good counter speech because I read that uh, yesterday actually that if you read something that is completely opposing your view, it drives you more into your view actually. So I wonder what would be an effective way to counter uh, a video as this. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, this is why I said earlier that counter messaging is is one tool among many, right? So we also, we can't forget about deplatforming, we can't forget about demonetization, we can't forget about the recommendation algorithms that Paul Joseph Watson's been depending upon for many years. Um, but I think one thing you can do with this particular video um, is just try to think about, okay, well, you know, to what degree is uh, is any of this actually true? So I actually listened to the video and then I started to do some research as to uh, whether or not these protests have actually caused the spread of the virus. So one of the things you might want to do is pick up on what's the main assertion that this person's making and try to think about whether or not that's true. But another thing you can do is uh, kind of by starting with the with the frames that you're looking at, um, one of the things you might want to do is think about, okay, well, how might I frame this in a different way? How might, what, maybe I can frame the question as which groups have been wearing masks in the protests and how much of an effect has that actually had on the extent to which there's been, uh, that these protests might be spreading, uh, spreading the virus, for example, right? Another thing you might want to do is try to point out the fact by using framing, one of the things you can do is try to deconstruct how is it that he's actually trying to create his message, right? So what you can try to do is take a little time and say, look how biased he is and try to point out some of what some of those biases and then compare it to other reports. But yeah, I mean, I, one of the things you have to realize is that once someone's kind of already in a kind of um, sort of network of this kind of extreme content, it's very hard to use facts to sort of change their mind. That's probably not going to work. Um, but that's more about the sort of limits of counter speech as a whole. Um, but the, one of the things I do think is if we do discourse analysis effectively, we can try to figure out how to kind of develop those frames uh, to, to try to counter those messages. Um, so we've got another question here. 
I find it difficult to find the frame. I find the expression and what they are saying, but how to find the perfect frame so later we can use it for coding. Is there any advice for frame delimitation? Um, and is a frame a word, a whole sentence, or an expression? Well, I think maybe it might be a good place to, to end if we just step back to that definition one more time. And so one of the things I want to stress is that a frame isn't really like a word or a statement, but it's a way in which uh, the person who's created a piece of content has tried to select particular elements of, that, uh, uh, of the phenomenon that they're describing rather than others. Right. So, for example, we could talk about uh, maybe like the, the Guardian might have had a newspaper article that said um, evidence suggests that BLM protests. This isn't necessarily true, but evidence suggests that BLM protests spread coronavirus. Uh, and then that would be that would be one way in which, you know, that might be a factual framing. Right. If that was, were true, say that there was a study that suggested that that were true compared to Paul Joseph Watson, who's saying, oh, um, I'm going to break Aaron's rule now about uh, offensive language. But um, uh, when Paul Joseph Watson says, you know, all of these people who are telling us to stay home are fucking hypocrites, right? That's a very different kind of framing. Um, so it's really about the how in which someone's saying something rather than just the what of what they're saying. You want to think about what are kind of aspects of reality are they selecting and what aspects are they leaving out to sort of leave you with a particular kind of interpretation or a particular kind of feeling uh, with, uh, 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 with what, what happens when you, when you view that content. I hope that kind of makes sense to, to answer your question. So in a way, a frame can be a word and it can be a sentence or an expression, but usually it's more about a selection of things, right? What is being selected in order to try to shape how someone who's listening or, or, or watching um, or reading, how might they actually interpret uh, the reality that you're trying to convey? Good, I think, I think this was a very nice way to end uh, this session because we're also over time, I think. Um, I hope you got a bit of an insight in what is discourse analysis, what is content analysis, and what is framing, even though it's perhaps a bit tricky still. And hopefully it will give you a bit of uh, ideas of how to how you can look at your online content or the online content of other groups in a different way and um, be a bit more critical and as well understand why some things are very um, popular and gain a lot of attention compared to others. Um, anything else to add, Farah? No, just uh, thanks everyone for your attention yeah. and uh, yeah, feel free to get in touch with us if you have any questions.